On today's episode, I'm talking all about anaesthetic risk in cats and whether it's actually worth spaying a cat when it's older. I'm then going to move on to what a small, medium and large dog breed actually is, which category your dog is going to fit into and why this matters at all. And then finally, I'm going to move on to what vaccines your cat actually needs and how often they should be vaccinated. But first, here's the intro. You're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Podcast, the show that answers all of your dog and cat health questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex and welcome to the 18th episode of the Dr. Alex Answers Show. Uh, There's something for everyone in this week's episode, whether you have a cat or a dog, a young pet or an old one. But before I jump into today's questions, I just wanted to remind you that you can get your question answered, whatever it is, just by submitting it over at dralexanswers.com. And then I also wanted to read out this review from Nikki, who writes, As an owner of a Gordon Setter, I really care about my dog's well-being. The advice from Alex is solid, applicable and easily understandable. Definitely an online source I recommend for every pet owner. So big thanks to Nikki for those kind words. And it's really hearing feedback like this that keeps me going with this podcast. You know, I love to hear what impact it's making in your life as well as your pet's life. So, you know, make sure you're subscribed if this podcast sounds like something you're interested in and you're not already. And if you do have a couple of spare minutes, I'd really appreciate it more than you can imagine. If you could leave me a review over on your podcasting app of choice or over at ourpetshealth.com slash review. And so let's jump into my first question, which is from Gander and Charlotte, who writes um, that they have a female eight-year-old exotic short-haired cat. Can she still be spayed? She is quite old, and obviously exotic shorties have very short nasal passages. Will she be all right to go under anesthesia? So really, there's two questions here. The first is, is it okay to spay an older cat? And the second one is, do short-nosed cats have an increased anesthetic risk? So let's start off by talking about spaying an older cat. So is it actually still worthwhile? Are there any health benefits? Well, spaying, it definitely can reduce stress. It reduces fighting, reduces spraying and marking behavior, um, and also clearly removes the chance of pregnancy. And also pyometra, which is uh, an infection of the uterus. And I liken it to, to the uterus becoming like a big balloon full of pus. So if you picture the kind of the long balloons that you make um, kind of balloon sculptures out of, you know, that's what it becomes. It becomes just like a big balloon full of pus. So Pyometra, if we're thinking about pyometra in cats, is actually less of a risk compared to dogs. So if we're thinking about dogs, that's really the most common situation that we find it in. Dogs have about a 25% or a one in four chance of developing pyometra by the time they get to 10 years of age. Now, cats are very different. So they actually have an average pyometra rate of about 2.2% by the age of 13. So that's clearly very much less than 25%. It does vary by breed though, so our standard moggy, so our domestic short hair, will be about 0.9%. Um, but if we go then to a Norwegian forest cat, that's 14.8%. Burman and Persians, um, so they're short-nosed um, cat breeds, and that might be um, the, kind of the, the, the breed of cat in this question. They're at 31 to 3.4%, and Siamese are about 8.8%. So the bottom line is, is it's quite variable. Your standard moggy, there's less than 1% chance of them developing a pyometra, certainly by the time they're 13 years of age. But other breeds, um, other purebreds and more exotic breeds might be kind of quite significantly higher than that. So maybe, you know, even one in one in 10, one in kind of one in eight or something like that. So that's one thing. But cat pyometra then has actually a fatality rate of about one in 20. So one in 20 cats who develop pyometra will die. And that's slightly higher than dogs, which might be for a number of reasons. And one of those might actually be because we don't see it quite so often. So we're not quite as attuned to the signs and symptoms of pyometra in cats that we might be in dogs. And so it's kind of more advanced and more difficult to treat when it is picked up. So that's really, you know, the benefits of spaying an older cat. We're going to have all the other benefits, but the pyometra risk is going to be the big one as as well. Now, moving on to anaesthetic risks in general. Now, well, anaesthetic and surgical procedures, they all involve some risk to a cat. 
same to a dog, same to us when we're going undergoing surgery or an anaesthetic. There is a small risk. Now, the risk of death for a healthy cat is around 0.1%. So really small. It's about one in a thousand. If a cat is sick, though, this risk does increase to about 5%, something like that. You know, it really is going to depend on what's going on, how sick your cat is, uh, you know, what other compromises they've got in um, and what surgery needs to be done. Now, anaesthetic technique does vary kind of in a, a huge range of different ways. So there's a number of different ways that we can anaesthetize a cat to carry out any degree of surgery, and they will vary with safety as well. So it varies from just completely injectable, so we just give injections to anaesthetize a cat, through to uh, giving a gas anaesthetic. So oxygen and anaesthetic gas is delivered through a tube straight into the lungs. Now, short-nosed cats, they also do have more tissue around their throat, which makes it more narrow, um, and that will likely increase the anaesthetic risk compared to a standard cat with a nose but if we're assuming that a gas anesthetic is given then obviously that kind of during the anesthetic period itself then that's not going to be a problem because there's going to be a tube going down kind of through the throats down into the lungs delivering that gas where the main risk period actually is though is after surgery so during that recovery period that is really when most cats um who are going to die under anaesthetic or as a result of their anaesthetic actually do pass away. So ideally, any cat really should be closely monitored in this time rather than just being kind of put away into, into their kennel or cage by themselves and not being observed. So that kind of post-anaesthetic, post-surgery period is absolutely critical in recovery. So I hope that answers this question. Really, the bottom line is, is that, yes, I do believe that spaying an older cat is absolutely worth it. And while there are risks with anaesthetics, and potentially slightly higher risks with a uh, squash nose cat breed, then you know they're not something I don't think to to worry overly about. If they if the cat's otherwise healthy, if there's no other concerns, you know, apart from the age, but their kidneys are working fine, you know, we might want to do a little blood test beforehand. We certainly would want to put them on fluids, ideally, if we can, to help support their blood pressure, um, to help support their organs and improve recovery as well. But if there's no other reasons, then absolutely, I think this is a procedure that would still be well worthwhile being carried out. And then just before I get into the next question, did you know that I actually have another show? So the Our Pets Health podcast, it dives deep into different pet health topics. It brings you my thoughts on the latest dog and cat uh, health news and health topics and helps you make informed decisions about the best way to care for your pet. If you enjoy this show, then you'll definitely love the Our Pets Health podcast. So just search for Our Pets Health on your podcasting app and subscribe today. You're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Show. Question number two is all about size of dogs. And it goes, everyone seems to use the term large and small breeds, but not one ever seems to be more descriptive about weights and sizes of what a large or small breed dog is. So really large and small breed definitions is going to vary depending on what context it's being used to discuss in and also if medium breed dogs are also being discussed separately so there's really no hard and fast rules the main reason that we'll talk and we need to think about what category a dog falls into and this will apply for every single dog um you know deciding whether they're a small breed, a medium breed or a large breed dog is when it comes to feeding them and especially when they're puppies. So the kind of classic example here is that feeding a large breed dog is really important to actually limit their speed of growth by reducing the amount of fat, calcium, phosphorus and vitamin D in their diet. Now that mean that, that might seem counterproductive that we want to actually slow down their growth when they've got so much to do but we do know that growing too quickly, so a large breed dog who grows too quickly, it really really increases their risk of various bone growth disorders and the classic ones here would be hip dysplasia, bad hips and elbow dysplasia as well. So the joints really just not forming properly, that cartilage may be having kind of holes or flaps of cartilage breaking free uh, and, and causing these joint problems, which are then with a, a large dog for life. Also then being a large dog, they're putting extra weight, stresses and strains through those joints. So they're going to get much worse arthritis than were they a small dog. So, you know, that's the classic reason why we need to think about whether we've got a small, medium or large breed dog. And from this point of view, when it comes to feeding, we generally consider that dogs less than 10 kilograms um, or 22 pounds are small breed dogs. Those over 25 kilograms are going to be large breed dogs. And 10 to 25 kilogram dogs or 22 to 55 pounds are going to be medium breeds. 
But there are differences in where this cutoff comes, depending on what we're talking about, like I said at the beginning. So if we're talking about cruciate ligament disease and the likelihood of success of conservative treatment, and I discussed this on episode 17 of the show, then a small breed would actually be less than 15 kilos and a large breed would be anything over 15 kilograms. So we don't really have a a medium sized dog kind of category in this situation. So in terms of the best time to spay a female dog, then a large breed is probably more like over 20 to 25 kilograms and this highlights the kind of one of the big problems about making this definition is that a lot of the time there are studies that we're kind of basing these recommendations on and they're produced but they only have a really small number of individuals or they might have a limited number of breeds and so it's actually really hard to extrapolate the results from those single isolated studies across the dog population as a whole and you know in all likelihood as with most things, there's no black and white. So it's more likely that there's a graduation effect. So rather than a really hard cutoff or boundary, you know, if, for example, with the cruciate ligament, if you're 14 kilos, then you're absolutely fine to be conservative treatment. If you're 16 kilos, then that's an absolute no-go. You know, there's not going to be that kind of specific kind of set cutoff where there's a marked difference. It's more likely to be just a graduation. Um, And also there might actually be specific risks that are more related to the breed of the dog rather than the size. And it's just those that were tested were all of a certain breed and happened to be big dogs. Whereas if they'd chosen other breeds to test, you know, there wouldn't have been such a difference. So really that's the difference there Um, and remember also that when we're talking about small medium and large breeds the weight that we're giving is actually the dog's healthy weight so not their actual weight if they're overweight and a lot of dogs unfortunately are overweight or obese there's a massive obesity epidemic in our pet population and so kind of these recommendations would be based on a dog's healthy weight rather than their actual weight and when it comes to feeding puppies the weight is their adult weight or their expected adult weight so there might be a few that are you know a little bit on the boundary but we need to think how big are they going to be when they're adults and that's where we make that small breed medium breed and large breed cut off. And then just remember that the information I give in these podcasts is not a substitute for a consultation and examination with your pet's veterinarian and should not be taken as specific advice for any individual pet. If your pet is unwell, if they're injured, or if they're suffering from any kind of problem, then talking to your vet is always going to be the best course of action. Get your question answered at dralexanswers.com. And then my final question is from Ken, who writes that he'd be interested if I could talk more about vaccine schedule in cats, as he's been hearing concern that frequent vaccination is suspected to be linked to kidney disease. Um, And the reason for that is that the use of feline kidney cells actually in vaccine development can then trigger a cat's own immune system to then start damaging its own kidneys. So there's an autoimmune response. And Ken then writes, it seems to be not so clear just how frequently cats really do need to be vaccinated. Now, vaccines really are the hot topic at the moment both in people and in pets and there's a lot of focus on social media and traditional media outlets as well about the potential side effects surrounding vaccination some of which are true and some of which are completely false now when it comes to vaccines causing kidney disease in cats there is one study to certainly to my knowledge that suggests vaccination may be linked to chronic kidney disease in cats and this is significant because chronic kidney disease it's a really common problem in older cats and if our vaccine vaccinations are causing that or making that disease more likely it's a risk factor for its development then you know that's something that's significant and we should be looking into and knowing if that is actually the case at all so in this study their cats were followed and the difference between those that did and those that didn't develop chronic kidney disease were looked into Now, many differences were examined, and in most cases, it was found that there was actually no difference between um, cats. So diet fell into this group, Um, and that's something to bear in mind that next time someone says that dry food causes kidney disease, well, in this this, um, study, that wasn't found to be the case at all. There was no link to what was being fed to the cat and whether they developed kidney disease. Now, vaccination every one to two years, as well as moderate to severe dental disease, were found to increase the risk of developing kidney disease. But before you get carried away, there are a couple of caveats that we'll talk about. So those vaccinated less frequently, so cats that were vaccinated every three years or even less frequently than that, they didn't seem to be at any increased risk of developing kidney disease. And that is also a significant finding. So there was no indication in this paper as to which vaccines were administered to know if certain cat vaccines make kidney disease more likely to co- compared to other cat vaccines that, that your cat might be given. Um, and really what 
vaccines there requires something that I'll come on to in a little bit. And also, this is just one study which also has some major limitations, both in how the data was analysed and also the fact that there were only 27 cats who developed kidney failure, with nearly half of the cats originally enrolled in the trial actually dropping out of the study for reasons unknown. So we don't know, you know, why half of the cats that originally enrolled fell out. It could be you know, because they succumbed to other disease or just the owners stopped stopped answering questions and there was no follow-up or they moved, that kind of thing. But also only 27 cats kind of were in that 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 group who developed kidney failure. So that's a pretty small sample size. Now, unfortunately, that's not uncommon with veterinary studies, with, our, with studies that look at, at, at all manner of different conditions in dogs and cats. They are often only involving very small numbers, which makes it very hard to draw firm conclusions when there's only one study that has been run. Now, that's not to say it's not right, but it's something to bear in mind. Like I say, all this isn't to discount the finding that there could well be a link between frequent vaccination and the development of kidney failure, but it's far from certain. And in fact, the majority of cats really should probably only be receiving a vaccine every three years, as I'll come on to. And these individuals were shown to be at no greater risk of developing kidney disease later on in life than cats not receiving any vaccination. So, you know, how relevant this is actually to the majority of cats, yeah, I'm not convinced. It may be something to think about, especially if your cat is having to have lots of vaccinations. But I think for the majority, it's not something we really need to be worried about. And, you know, we also can't lose sight of why we're vaccinating in the first place. So, as I could have suggested, we then need to think about, well, what vaccines does your cat actually need? And how often do you then really need to get your cat vaccinated, which was the other part of Ken's question. And this is really going to depend on the lifestyle of your cat. So our core vaccines for every cat, so they want the ones that really every cat needs, regardless of lifestyle, are cat flu. So that covers two different viruses. So herpes virus and Khaleesi virus are those. And it also covers uh, something called panleukopenia, which is also known as feline parvovirus. So they're given as kittens. They start generally from about six to eight weeks of age when your kitten's uh, a couple of months old. Uh, And then they have a three vaccination course finishing at or just after 16 weeks of age. Now, panleukopenia is then given again between six and 12 months kind of after that initial course. And it's then only going to be needed every three years. So it lasts for a long time, certainly lasts for at least three years. Now, it might be that it does last longer, but three years is that kind of minimum amount of time that we know it lasts for. And that's the recommended revaccination time for the majority of cats. Now, the cat flu vaccines, unfortunately, they are less effective than the panleukopenia. So you remember that the cat flu vaccines do make part of that core vaccine as well. And here, revaccination is really going to be based on risk. So every three years, again, is going to be the recommendation for cats at low risk of this disease. But for cats that are high risk, um, that's going to be based on discussion with your veterinarian. It could be because they're living in a cat colony. It could be because they're going into a cattery very often, a boarding cattery or something like that. They're going to be at much higher risk. And if that's the case, they're going to need a vaccination every year. So, you know, that's really something to to bear in mind there. And then rabies is going to be another core vaccine if either it's required by law or your cat goes outdoors and rabies is present in your country. Because really, you know, you've got to consider that rabies isn't to be messed with. It's an incredibly serious disease. It's serious for your cat, but as or more importantly, it's also serious in people. So the fatality rate is absolutely huge. And, you know, that's not something we want to play around with. Now, there are three yearly rabies vaccines. And so these also won't add to the potential for increasing the risk of kidney disease, as I kind of discussed at the start of the question. If we then move on to non-core vaccines. So these are vaccines that really we could otherwise call them, you know, potentially lifestyle vaccines. And they include things like feline leukemia virus or FELV, FIV, so feline immunodeficiency virus, um, and also chlamydia will be included in these non-core vaccines. And they're going to be based on the presence of the disease in your area and also the lifestyle of your cat really to determine the risk of infection. And so the benefits of the vaccination compared to the very small risks associated with vaccines in general. So with every medical decision, be that vaccination, you know, be that anything, else, any other surgical procedure, whatever it is, we're constantly doing a risk benefit analysis. So if the risks are high for developing these diseases, then, you know, vaccination is definitely going to be recommended. If the risks are very, very low, or clearly, if the diseases aren't present where you live, then we don't need to worry about vaccination. But that's something that really needs to to be discussed with your vet because they'll vary for, uh, you know, not just 
by area but also by individual lifestyle of a cat you know whether they're an outdoor cat only whether they go outside under supervision or whether they're just free to come and go as they please would be kind of clear examples of of kind of different lifestyle choices and then the other thing to say about these non-core vaccines is that they are annual vaccines so they could potentially have a small risk of increasing the likelihood of kidney failure later on in life but you know like i said with with that part of the answer we don't want to over exaggerate the risk of that and then if we're talking about vaccine side effects in general the risk of that is somewhere around kind of 50 per 10,000 cats vaccinated with over half of those reactions really just being mild lethargy you know going off their food having a slight fever really simple signs that show that the vaccine has actually triggered an immune system uh, the, the immune system to do something kind of almost tricked it into being ill if you like and these signs they typically only last for 24 to 48 hours you know they're really mild the cat might be under the weather for a little bit but you know that's probably the same as you when you have your vaccine i certainly know from me when i have my um, tetanus vaccine or my other vaccines i do tend to feel pretty ropey for 24 to 48 hours don't need any specific treatment and then i'm right as rain and it's you know generally the same for your cat so severe reactions really are very rare that's not to say that they don't happen but they are very rare now the other thing to say is that all of these recommendations, they're based on the WSAVA, which is the World Small Animal Veterinary Association vaccination guidelines. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And it goes into more details about how the immune system works and what, vaccination, what vaccines actually do to trigger that immunity. And then finally, as I've kind of suggested and hinted at already in this answer, it's really important not to lose sight of why we are actually vaccinating our cats. So vaccines, they're typically used to prevent diseases that either have a high potential of being fatal and resulting in death or are likely to have a significant impact on a cat's quality of life. So if we're not seeing these diseases very often because vaccines are almost a victim of their own success, you know, that's the bottom line. These diseases, they're pretty nasty diseases that can have a massive impact on your cat's life, either by shortening it or meaning that they're living with a chronic, long-term, horrible disease that, you know, otherwise we can prevent. So that's it for this episode of the podcast. Remember that I could be answering your question on the next episode simply by heading over to dralexanswers.com. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd also love it if you could let three of your pet owning friends know what they're missing out on if they're not listening to the show already. And until next week, I'm Dr. Alex. Take care. You've been listening to the Dr. Alex Answers podcast. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show where you ask the questions and Dr. Alex answers.